Welcome back to the channel, everyone. We are reviewing Kaito Bane of Nightmares, the brand new Planeswalker from the Duskmorn set. We're talking a blue black walker, the third Kaito in this game. And how is he as a Planeswalker, though? Well, first let's look at what his stats are here. He is 116 hit points. Actually not bad at all. And then his mana spread. He's got plus 5, plus 5 to blue and black, plus 2 to red, and minus 2 to white and green. So this is kind of the Kazmina Dak Faden mana bonus spread, which I do like. If you've been following me for a while now, you know that. And then his deck limits are six creatures, seven spells, and six supports. That's pretty good. That's not bad. I have no issues with that there. Okay, now that we got all the positives out of the way, let's talk about his loyalty abilities. All right. Ninja technique, fallen leaves, ability one, nine loyalty. Nine loyalty to surveil three, draw a card, then create a Kaito Shadow Clone token. So, this ability is, I think, his best one. Because what's cool about it is, so you got Surveil 3. In case you don't remember what Surveil does, it basically lets you look at the next four cards in your library and destroy from your library the cards that you don't want. And then you get to choose... Uh, up to three of the cards that you would like to place in the graveyard. And then you draw a card. So this basically means you can pick out of the next four cards which card to put into your hand. And that's pretty good. Then create a Kaito Shadow Clone token. And what is that token? Here we go. It's a blue and black creature. It's a 1-1 one, one ninja Legendary token with hex proof. There aren't very many legendary tokens in the game. I believe the tokens from the Kaldheim set, the Herald tokens, are legendary, but that's, I think, about it. So, what does this creature do? When this creature deals combat damage to your opponent's planeswalker, if this creature has one or more reinforcements, gain two loyalty. Then, if this creature has four or more reinforcements, this creature's base power toughness becomes 3-4. So, in my playtesting, it is really rare, actually, to get, the, get enough reinforcements for this creature to do anything good for me. When I'm dealing combat damage, you gain two loyalty. That's not enough. Base power toughness becomes 3-4. That's really not enough either. Because at the end of the day, that's going to be what, a 12-16 for using your abilities four times or more? That's really not good payoff, I would say. Um, what I would do to improve these tokens is definitely give them more loyalty. I think it was even a 2-2. Two -two. That might be fine. If you gained X loyalty where X is equal to the power of this creature then that would be great then that would be a reason for you to use this creature as of now how it works there's really no reason to use this creature i think if this creature was a card that you can put into your deck it'd be an uncommon at best if you think that's worth it for you then knock yourself out but for me it's definitely not um yeah that's Pretty much what I have to say about ability one. Let's move to ability two. Ninja technique. Winds of change. Ability two. 15 loyalty. Destroy target opposing creature. The first card in your hand gains six mana. Then create a Kaito shadow clone token. So destroying target opposing creature is always going to be relevant. It's not a bad ability to have just in a pinch. But it would be nice if you didn't have to... It would be better if you could target any creature. Like for yourself, if you could, you know, destroy your own Kaito Shadow Clone token and gain six mana for doing so, then I might do that sometimes. 
you know, if I really needed to. I mean, 15 loyalty to gain 6 mana is not a great conversion either way. It's better than doing other things with your loyalty. But it is better than doing a few other things with your loyalty, including Ability 3. This is Ability 3, Ninja Technique, Puppy Steps, 21 Loyalty. So what do you get for 21 Loyalty? Your creatures gain plus 2, plus 2, and unblockable. Opposing creatures gain Stun Counter 1, then create a Kaito Shadow Clone token. That is it. That is what its third ability gets you. Gauze and I were talking about this, and... We do believe that this is one of the worst third abilities in the game. It's just such a small payoff for what you're spending here. 21 loyalty to only get plus 2 plus 2 and unblockable. Your creatures gaining plus 2 plus 2 is, might as well be 0. And then unblockable is cool sometimes, but for the most part, it's a fairly irrelevant ability. Um, there are times where, you know, you want to get around a Vindicator. But you know what I'd rather do to get around a Vindicator? Use this ability. So, opposing creatures gaining stun counter 1. That is it. I mean, that just basically makes them disabled for one turn. And it doesn't even trigger on the turn that you use this. So, that's the way stun counters work. And then creating just one more Kaito Shadow Clone token. It's just it's just terrible. I only used it a couple times. One to see, okay, um, just to see what it does. And then there was another time where the unblockable was kind of relevant. I think I was trying to get around um, a couple of Vindicators or something. I forget why I used it, to be honest. When an ability is so bad that you can't even justify using it over any of your other abilities, then you know it's really bad, especially when it costs you 21 loyalty. For that much loyalty, you could do the first ability twice and almost do her second ability twice as well. So, so it's really just very ineffective here. So the pros... Decent hit point limit, a favorable mana spread, and it is a color combo I like. And that's about it. <laughs> All the rest of the cons are really bad cons. The abilities themselves are overcosted, especially for what you get out of them. The tokens from his abilities are largely ineffective, and it's easily one of the worst third abilities we've ever seen in this game. So that's really what it comes down to. And let me show you what I think his abilities should look like to make him a better Planeswalker. All right, here is the new and improved Kaito Bane of Nightmares. This is a main loop remix. Still same loyalty cost, but we are improving it by a lot. So we still surveil three, but now when we draw a card, it gains eight mana. Still creating a Kaito Shadow Clone token, but we are improving that token. This is what I would do. It's going to be a 2-2 this time, but I kind of messed up this part a little bit. But when this creature attacks, gain X loyalty. X is this creature's power. So from the outset, it's not going to be a lot of loyalty, but at least it doesn't have to be reinforced. And it can scale up to however much you can. But I like the chance to be able to make more loyalty off of it. And the Ninja Technique Winds of Change. We're reducing it to 12 loyalty. We're destroying target opposing creature. And then the first card in your hand gains 8 mana instead of 6. And then reinforce your ninja cards. So not only your Kaito Shadow Clone. But if you're playing with something like Nashi. That would be great. Because... You're going to be pumping up the loyalty that you can get from the Kaito Shadow Clone. And something like Nashi would be destroying more cards from your library, which is the reason that you would be playing that card. And then third ability, reducing it to 18 loyalty. Your creatures gain plus 8 plus 8 and unblockable. It didn't make sense to me that it only got plus 2 plus 2. I feel like the ability as it is 
feels like a level one ability more than a level four. So this would scale it up so that you get plus two to each creature as you level up the ability. Opposing creatures gain stun counter four. That's way more relevant. Uh, maybe I should have put in opposing creatures are disabled until end of turn, and then they gain stun counter four. That would be even better, but oh well. Um, and then create four Kaito Shadow clone tokens. So instead, you start off with an 8-8 eight, eight Kaito Shadow clone. So that's going to be not only starting off way better with your clone tokens, but also you would have the opportunity to stack these up on top of any other Kaito Shadow clones that you had already created. There's a lot more interesting synergy happening here. Plus, this would make him a way more useful and fun Planeswalker to use. So if you guys agree with this, uh, send it out to Webcore. Let him know. <laughs> Say, we want this Planeswalker buffed. And maybe they will take you up on it. I have no idea. They probably won't. But, you know, worth a shot. It's, it was kind of fun to theory craft here, um, this Planeswalker. But, uh, yeah, if this Planeswalker was how I reimagined him here, I would like him a lot more. Okay, so I have three decks for you to share with you. And I honestly have to say that these decks will work with other Planeswalkers and will probably work better with them. But if you're not going to pick this guy up anyway, maybe you watch this part of the video and use these decks in like Ashiok or Dakon or any of the other Kaitos. And you might have a better time with that. So here we go. All right. For this first deck, I wanted to showcase a Demon Tribal deck. And so part of the reason I want to do that is because this card, Three Tree City, at the beginning of your turn, you have at least three different creatures that share a type in your library, gain 10 mana, otherwise gain five mana. So this card is going to give you an amazing amount of mana every turn just for having three demons in your deck. And so I chose what I thought are the three best demons I have in standard right now. Rakdos, really can't go wrong with him. Seeing him everywhere in the meta for good reason. He's one of the most annoying and difficult creatures to face right now because he's just going to be continuously destroying things that you put into play. So you really have to have an answer for him no matter where you are in your stage of the game. We got Bloodletter of Aklazots, also a demon. Going to be double striking. Well, kind of. Uh, in essence, double striking with this because it doubles the damage. So it does the damage twice. So it, it actually triggers damage twice instead of just doubling it. Which goes well with Valgavoth, Harrower of Souls, which is also a demon. Brand new masterpiece from the Duskmorn series. It's got Ward. It's 4-4 with Flying and Impending. So if you don't know how Impending works yet, it basically reduces the cost of the card per turn, but it also debuffs your creature. So if you play this on your first turn, you're going to be uh, casting it for very little mana, but it's only going to end up being like a 1-1. One, one. But when your opponent loses life or is dealt damage, this creature gets plus one, plus one. Then your black mana bonus is increased by one for two turns. This effect can trigger up to four times per turn. So you're really going to be boosting up your black mana bonus with that blood letter of Aklazots because you're going to be dealing damage twice per attack. So... It not only is it going to be buffing up this creature, but look at that black mana, mana bonus getting increased by a lot every time you're attacking. So this also helps with cryptics because buffing up that black mana bonus means that you'll be converting to black gems with cryptics. And that'll be nice to be getting all those black gems to match and get lots of mana from. Demolition Field is in here because it's just a card that you really need in your collection especially with the meta right now there are a lot of really good supports that can really mess you up including other demolition fields so if you're going to be running supports make sure this is one of them 
Um, the rest of these cards are really just about getting your demons into play. Rite of the Moth is another great new mythic. Pick two of the first four creature cards from your graveyard. Put those cards into play under your control. Then those cards gain Death Touch, Life Link, and Finality. So that's going to be getting Life Link to all of our creatures. And we'll be able to keep our life totals high. Time Reversal. Snuff Out is in here because of the ability to corrupt two black gems. And so sometimes it gets you more black gems to match. Really with... Uh, Rakdos, Snuff Out, Demolition Field. That should be enough removal for most cases. Time Reversal is great for not only um, disrupting your opponent's hand, but also getting you more mana into your hand. I found as I was piloting this deck enough times that I needed more cards in my hand a lot of the time. So that is why Kaya Intangible Slayer Vanguard is in here. For zero shield cost on your Vanguard, you can draw two cards. So it just easily makes sure that you have a lot of cards in your hand, um, especially when you're using time reversal. The most effective way to use time reversal, in my opinion, is by having a lot of cards in your hand when you play it so that you can have a lot of new cards with a lot of mana in them. So it's a pretty straightforward deck. Just build up your demons and you know deal damage to victory so relatively simple concept for this deck but i think it works pretty well okay on to the next one okay this next deck is mostly centered around funeral room brand new card from duskmorn and really the part about this card that is more interesting is awakening hall when the support enters the board, return each creature card from your graveyard to play under your control. So it really takes some time to make sure that you have creatures to put into play from your graveyard. So you got to fill your graveyard with creatures first, but also spending some mana getting Awakening Hall into play as well. There are a lot of things happening in here that really take advantage of bring things out of your graveyard we got the master of keys a new masterpiece from duskmorn amazing card 23 mana to cast but it does have impending five so so that cost is going to be reduced by a lot this creature does take into account a lot how much power it has in the beginning because when this creature enters the battlefield, destroy the top five cards of your library, then double this creature's power and toughness. Um, the part that's most relevant for me in the beginning is the destruction of your library, because that's hopefully going to be putting a lot of creatures into your graveyard that we then will be pulling out with Funeral Room. And then what I was talking about, you double this creature's power and toughness. So if it comes into play as a 2-2, that's not going to be doing much for you. But if you play it from your graveyard, we don't have to worry about the impending. It doesn't affect you in that same way. So when you're casting a bunch of these from your graveyard into play or summoning them, you're going to get a huge master of keys. And this is going to be one of the main win cons of this deck, as you will see soon. Uh, when this creature attacks, return the first enchantment from your graveyard to your hand. It gains full mana. So hopefully, a lot of times you're going to be bringing back a funeral room or ripples of undeath. Icor Moon Gauntlet is in here because it just works really well with vanguards. And uh, we're using Jace the Perfected Mine. It's a win con even on its own, but the main thing about it is that it's going to be helping us destroy more library cards. So that's going to be pulling in more creatures into our graveyard that we then can pull out with Awakening Hall. Tyvar Jubilant Brawler, we get that haste. So anything we pull out of the graveyard with Funeral Room or Shieldred will be uh, ready to attack. And so... When this goes off correctly, you're going to have a huge master of keys, pretty much uh, one-shotting your opponent when you're lucky. Ripples of Undeath is here. 
um, to gain us some loyalty, which you really need some loyalty generation in this deck when you're using Kaito Shieldred. This will also be milling your opponent's library so that you can um, make the Shieldred Saga token. And the thing that we're really going to want to pay attention to is the third chapter of the saga. Move all creature and support cards from all graveyards into play under your control. Return the first card named Shieldred from exile to the battlefield under your control. So the awesome thing about having... Uh, the gauntlet in here along with Shieldred is um, when you cast a card during your turn when you, you have the saga at the third chapter, you're going to be re-triggering it. And um, you are almost guaranteed to pull a Master of Keys out of the graveyard and it will be uh, triggering the ETB of destroying top f five cards of your library. So... Um, even though Shieldred exiles all graveyards, you will be replenishing your own graveyard with Master of Keys when it gets summoned from the Shieldred token. So, great synergy there. Um, Phenomenon Investigators, phenomenal card. <laughs> uh, I almost always choose option B on this card when I'm playing it. Um, there are times where you might want to use the option A, creating poltergeist token. If you need a token for whatever reason, maybe to hit some objectives, um, sometimes it's useful for that. But it's really about drawing a card and gaining full mana. Basically just getting a free card to play. It's kind of like a bring to light as a creature. If you guys remember that legacy card, it's basically the same thing, but in a creature form. So... What's great about this is if you remember to keep your hand without cards when you get to the true scriptures token, whenever you summon one of these from the graveyard into play, it's going to be triggering that option B and you're going to be getting cards with full mana in your hand um, just for summoning this creature from the battlefield. So really awesome there. Um, lock and load is there just to help things get going. If you get start with a bad hand, it's a good card to play in the beginning because uh, discard your hand, draw four cards, and then the last two cards in your hand gain full mana. I pretty much never use a plotted emblem, but it is something that can be useful. Return each posing creature to your opponent's hand. I just never really think to to use that part of the card, but it is good. And then some more removal here. This is a new card that I really like, although it does have its quirks. Live or die. You may destroy the first opposing creature if you don't return the first creature from your graveyard to the battlefield. So you get an option when you play this either to hit confirm or not now. If you are planning just to use this to return a creature from the graveyard to the battlefield, you have to hit not now. If you hit confirm, it will just cast without doing anything. But if you do hit confirm and there's a creature on their side of the battlefield, it will destroy it. So that's good. It's um, untargeted removal. So it's a great little utility card because it can do two very relevant effects. So I really like this card. I hope to see they change the auto casting ability from it. It also has flash, so that can be relevant too. It's a little expensive, but it is a good card. I think it is going to be kind of a staple card for me going forward. So there you have it. This deck does take some time to get set up. It doesn't always win because sometimes you just don't have enough removal to carefully and patiently set everything up but when it works it really hits like a bomb so if you can build this deck i think you'll really have fun with it okay one more deck for you all right this last deck is kind of a weenie deck i would call it it does have a bunch of low power creatures but there are a lot of fun things that happen in this deck so one of the main cool things about it, I mostly built this around Swarm Yard. Uh, at the beginning of your turn, gain five mana. At the end of your turn, return the first rat, insect, spider, or squirrel card from your graveyard into play under your control if you can't create a Golgari spider token. So 
right off the bat, we're getting five mana per turn, which is not irrelevant. Definitely helps you get things going in this deck. But uh, also, we're creating either a little token that has reach that can help keep you a little safe for a bit as you get the rest of your deck going. But even just that helps a little bit. But we can actually pump up this little spider token if we want with other means. Really one of the cool things about this is being able to bring in an insect or spider from your graveyard into play. And we got um, this spider here. This is a uh, brand new uncommon. I like this guy, Brood Spinner. It's a spider with reach. It's 2-3, but it only costs 8 mana. When this creature enters the battlefield, surveil 2. I really like that because you can basically target creatures when you surveil and put them in your graveyard and just bring them back for free um, at the end of your turn. When this creature dies, create X Golgari insect tokens. So these are just the one ones, black and green. X is a number of different creature cards in each graveyard. You don't usually get a big stack of insects from doing this, but um, depending on what you have going on, it can help. Uh, this new card, I actually quite like. You know, we're missing Angel of Suffering from our current standard. It would be so great to have it with all these new graveyard recursion cards. But this is kind of a poor man's Angel of Suffering. But let's talk about it. When this creature deals combat damage to your opponent's Planeswalker, destroy the top X cards of your library. X is this creature's power. Then you may fetch the first enchantment card from your graveyard. If you don't, this creature gets plus two, plus two. So I just pretty much buff this creature by not fetching enchantments. If you want to build around this creature in other ways, feel free. But I'm just trying to get this thing as high powered as I can so that I'm putting as much into the grave as possible. And that's how I've been using her. Then Crow Whipcracker. It's an insect, so that's going to be uh, relevant with Swarm Yard and any other card that's bringing creatures back from the grave. But really the main reason that this card is in here is the untargeted removal that you have with it. Destroy an opposing card at random. And it's only 6 mana, so it's really easy to, to cast. But because of uh, Swarm Yard, you can pretty much bring one into play from your graveyard every turn if you have enough cards in your graveyard. So pretty awesome. Necromancy, another way of putting things not only into the graveyard, but also into play. At the beginning of your turn, return the first creature with base power 9 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield with its reinforcement. So if you get your spider or whipcracker destroyed, then just bring it back into play with necromancy. At the end of your turn, you may destroy the top two cards from your library. If you do, reinforce each non-legendary creature you control. Um, the way this card works is you have to have a creature in play to even be able to destroy those top two cards from your library. But it does work well with this deck because we have a handful of non-legendary creatures. When this support is destroyed, destroy all creatures. That has happened to me a few times, but um, it's usually not something I worry about too much. It does have four shields, so it's a little bit difficult to destroy. Um, right of the Moth, we talked about this card before, but it's a great way to get lifelink on all of our creatures. Molten Collapse, you know the deal. This is just really good untargeted removal and just a nice utility card. Meat Hook Massacre 2. This card is actually pretty cool. I wasn't sure about it at first, but um, it did catch my eye when I was looking at the previews. When this support enters the board, destroy all creatures. So you got to be a little bit careful with that. You might be at a point where um, you don't necessarily want to do that. So you got to be a little careful. When a creature you control dies, return the last creature from the graveyard to the battlefield under your control. That creature gains finality. When an opposing creature dies, exile it. So a couple of reasons I like this card. Obviously the graveyard recursion, but also if you're going against Grist, uh, one of the most dangerous things about Grist is being able to 
easily bring creatures from your graveyard into play. But if you destroy a Rakdos, for example, with Meat Hook Massacre on the battlefield, um, Gris won't be able to bring it right back with its first ability. So I do like this card. It's a little pricey um, at 23 mana, but it is a cool card. And uh, one of my favorite cards in this deck is sort of the squeak. Because at the beginning of your turn, your first creature gets plus X plus X until beginning of your next turn. X is the number of creatures you control base power or toughness, two or less, including their reinforcements. So I think all of our creatures um, have that base power, toughness, two or less. So you could see that there. But really what the power of this card is, is the last sentence. When a creature enters the battlefield under your control, that creature gets plus two plus one and gains the squirrel subtype. So... You're going to be putting a lot of these creatures into play, even Brood Spinner creating insect tokens, along with Swarm Yard creating some little tokens. Enough times that you put them into play, you're actually going to be buffing them up to a decent degree. So you're, these little weenies are going to be attacking for like 20 power a turn um, if everything goes well. And it's been a pretty effective deck, actually. You know, it does have a lot of masterpieces in it. So, I mean, I'm not blind to that fact. But it actually doesn't have a lot of really high rarity or mana cost cards. So, this deck is actually um, a pretty decent deck if you want to keep things on the lower end of mana cost. Like, there are cards in here that you don't necessarily need. You can find replacements for Necromancy, Rite of the Moth, Meat Hook Massacre. But I would really recommend having Swarm Yard and Sword of the Squeak if you're going to build this deck. Otherwise, it's just a little too slow. You just don't have a lot of power to win games easily without Sword of the Squeak. So that's my only caveat there. But it is a cool deck, and um, yeah, I hope you guys like it. All right. On to the grades. All right, let's get started on grades here. Maximum hit points, not bad. B plus, could definitely be worse. I have really not a lot of issue at 116, so we're fine there. Mana spread, also we're fine with that too. I like it. It's an A for me. Ability one, okay. It is probably my favorite ability, and it's fairly unique. I do wish it had a little bit more oomph to it. Um, those shadow tokens are pretty bad, so I knock it down a little bit for that, but not the worst. C+, pretty average. Like I said, the Surveil 3 draw card is nice for... Just getting the right card that you want in your hand. I do wish you got a little bit more out of it though. Ability 2. Pretty decent ability in a pinch. It is a bit expensive. But it does have its utility. So I'm giving it a B-. minus, Even though I think it is a better ability than his first one. So I am going to rate it a little higher than the first one. Even if I use the first ability more. Uh, it is a bit over costed, so that's why I didn't rate it higher. And then ability three. Um, I hope I don't offend anybody with this, but I am giving it a D. Really, the only redeeming quality about it is that you stun your opponents for a turn, which sometimes you might need it to get out a jam there, but. If you're relying on this ability for any reason, then the match has gone seriously wrong. And uh, we talked about all the different ways that this ability is bad. So we don't need to harp on it too much more. But I can't remember the last time an ability disappointed me this much. Versatility. Really the only versatility that I can really think of just comes from his color combo and his mana spread. That's the only thing that's really um, giving him much of a positive in terms of versatility. I think he's pretty average in your ability to build around him. 
He can do some graveyard recursion stuff built into him because of that Surveil 3, but that's really about it. I feel like there are a lot better choices there. Any of the Ashiarchs are going to do a lot better for you in terms of that. So I give him a C. Pretty middle of the road there. Uh, card utility. I don't think he's very good at doing much more for your cards. I think that he's one of these planeswalkers where you need the right cards to make him shine in. Um, in this day and age, you don't want to have to go against planeswalkers that are much superior and actually enhance the cards that you give them with this planeswalker where you have to use certain cards in order to make him better functioning for you. Like, you shouldn't have to use certain cards just to make use of his loyalty abilities. Things like Steam Core Scholar and Ripples of Undeath are great in any deck, but they're really essential in this deck. So you don't want to have to rely on cards to make him good because once they rotate out of standard, they're not there for you anymore. So he gets a D in card utility. Fun. You know, I was able to have some fun with him, but there was a lot of frustration. That third ability being so terrible means that you don't even want to use it. So that definitely knocks down the fun factor for him. Uh, the fun really came from the decks I was able to build for him. So I'm giving him a C in that category. This guy gets a C minus and that might be a little generous. Just in my rankings, it is pretty hard to get anything under a C, but it's also a little difficult to get over a B. So most of the Planeswalkers, if you followed my channel for a long time, they fall in the A to B range. Webcore has been doing pretty well with Planeswalkers, but man, this one just really missed the mark for me. And I don't think that my suggested tweaks make him too overpowered. When there are Planeswalkers out there like Grist, Dakon, PMA, Ajani, anything like that, that give you just so much more of an advantage over you, why would you choose a Planeswalker like this that's so mediocre and his abilities don't do a lot for you? I really think that this one is, is a, a hard pass for me. CM below is really hard for me to recommend people. So once we get into C minus territory, it, things really drop off. I would uh, much prefer using a C plus walker over a C minus walker even. So there's even um, levels below the overall grading letter that I put down here. So. I'm sorry to Webcore for having to rate this Planeswalker so low, but we got to keep it real here. We got to do the public a service here, and I don't want to have people spend money or crystals on this Planeswalker only to be disappointed and want to get refunds and stuff. That leaves a bad taste in the player base's mouth, so... If you're looking for a new blue and black walker and you haven't picked up any of the Ashiox, that is a much better choice in my opinion. So either way, thank you to Webcore for letting me try out this Planeswalker. He wasn't my favorite, nowhere near it, but it is still appreciated. And uh, speaking of Planeswalkers that you'll have a lot more fun with, um, I'm currently testing out the new Liliana from Duskmorn, and I think that you will like her a lot more, even with her being only monocolor. So yeah, look forward to that. And yeah, let me know what you guys think. Was I spot on? Too harsh or not harsh enough? All right, see you in the next one.